Joining us on the line from Washington is Kenneth Liebertal, director of the John Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institute. Kenneth is a former National Security Council senior director for Asia. Kenneth Liebertal, thanks very much indeed for joining us. First up, uh, what do you make of this move now in terms of China becoming the world's second biggest economy? Is it more about prestige than anything else? Well, uh, size matters. Being the world's second largest economy uh, reflects the fact that China now has not only a regional but a global economic impact. At the same time, it doesn't have the quality of economy that Japan has long had. It's still in many ways a developing country with a lot of areas of its economy that are quite weak and very few really global firms of global quality. So uh, size matters. Uh, its policies will make a big difference to the rest of us, uh, but we should not assume that because it's the world's second largest economy, it is a fully modern economy. It's got to get itself off or wean itself off export-driven growth here, doesn't it, Kenneth? And how does it do that, and how does it actually make a trickle-down economy work if it does work at all? Well, you know, China now has uh, household consumption as a percentage of GDP by far the lowest of all major economies in the world, and in fact, 10 points lower than it was a decade ago. So there's a lot of room for China to boost domestic demand. That, in part, will require paying its workers more money. And as your uh, commentator said a few moments ago on this show, uh, they are in the process of doing that. Uh, so they need to shift toward increasing domestic demand, uh, reducing their reliance on exports. Uh, but that's going to be inevitably a multi-year process. This is not a switch that they can turn on and off. But we'll have to see whether over the next five years or so they can make uh, sufficient readjustments to have that really have an impact on their need to keep boosting exports and if they can't boost domestic demand. How significant is it that when China in June announced that it was going to be allowing a slightly more flexible exchange rate regime that we then saw it actually come back and withdraw from buying quite as many U.S. Treasuries as, they, uh, as, as you just alluded to? Well, I think China is backing off from increasing its holdings of U.S. Treasuries largely because it has tremendous exposure to the U.S. dollar and to the U.S. economy. Uh, and so it does want to diversify as a matter of principle. I think that simply reflects prudent management of its own foreign exchange reserves, uh, and especially holding so much of its wealth in dollars. Uh, if it does increase the value of the renminbi vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, as it has uh, begun to create the flexibility to do, uh, every percentage increase in that value of the renminbi is a percentage decrease in the value of its in the renminbi value of its dollar holding. So it's trying to balance a uh, a number of different things here. At the end of the day, China retains a tremendous interest in the vibrancy of the U.S. economy and the strength of the U.S. dollar. And so I don't think we're going to see any massive flight from uh, China's holdings of U.S. debt coming up. That would be self-defeating, and they well recognize that. Well, from you know this newfound economic muscle, if you will, uh, what does that translate into in terms of, well, geopolitical muscle? Well, China has the capability now to use a lot of money to back its policy preferences. One of the areas we've been seeing that in in recent years is build up a military capability. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense just came out with its annual uh, review of uh, military developments in China, and what it suggests is that the Chinese are building a blue water navy, they're building power projection capabilities, uh, they're seeking to uh, create the capacity to do better in securing their own supply lines for vital uh, oil and natural gas imports and so forth. In addition, China is clearly now boosting its own uh, capital investments abroad, as primarily in commodities, uh, you know, iron ore, uh, other kinds of minerals, oil and gas, and so forth. Uh, China Can it leave until Kenneth, Kenneth, we're out of time, yes. but thank you so much for joining us. Kenneth Liebertold there from the Brookings Institute.